Welcome back. Recovered from last night, I hope. Wasn't that a beautiful view? We really have been lucky out with weather. Um, okay. So we're ready to start another day. We've got a remarkable keynote speaker this morning. Mr. Rich Siebert. Uh, he's the well, one of the original developers of 10 megabit Ethernet. He's one of the he was on the original Vax design team. Um, and unfortunately now he's left our ranks and gone over to the dark side. He now <laughs> doesn't practice, but has gone to law school. He can explain that to you. Um, and, and may, if you get in a private conversation. Um, I'd like to bring him to the stage, please. A round of applause. Morning, everybody. Hope you've had your coffee. I need my coffee in the morning. My, my life, my, my day is a progression of drugs. It, it progresses. It progresses from caffeine to aspirin to alcohol. As, as, as you go through from the morning. Uh, uh, as Janice said, I was one of the original guys who did the uh, Ethernet. I was at, uh, where's my, where did I put, okay. yeah, where's the advancer? Ah, oh, here it is. You know, you get old. I actually had hair back then. No, you know, sometimes you, you just, it's your lucky day. You luck out. I was at deck. We finished this one project, back 780. Uh, engineering, development engineering is like pinball. You ever play pinball? I like pinball. Back in the old days when it was mechanical pinball. You know, what, you know what's great about pinball? What's the, what's the prize you get for winning? You get to play a game. <laughs> and that's what it is in engineering too. If you finish a project and you're successful, you get to work on something new and interesting. And Deck was very good about that. They're going to look like one of the greatest companies in the world that no longer exists. That's another entire talk of all the great things that Deck didn't do. Uh, but DEC was, was sort of a meritocracy, and if you finished a project and you were successful, you got your pick of the next project. And I got my pick of a whole bunch of projects, but I was a young kid. Who knows what, what you want to work on? And I had the opportunity to work on a whole bunch of communications projects. I'm a communications engineer, what do you want? Uh, the, the work I did on the back switch and the back communication systems and the back plane and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'll work on this network thing, mostly because it involved flying out to California. And I'd never been to California before. I was you know, working on the East Coast. And he said, why well, don't you get to work with these guys out in Palo Alto? And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's go out to Palo Alto. And so for the next two years, I was commuting from the East Coast to Palo Alto. I had an office at Xerox Park in Palo Alto and working for DEC in Massachusetts and commuting out here uh, every other day or so. Last month was the 40th anniversary of the invention of Ethernet. Wow. There's been some birthday celebrations and you know people giving talks. Uh, IEEE 802 meeting coming up uh, uh, in July, in just a few uh, in just a few weeks in Geneva. There's going to be a big 40th anniversary. Thing. Can you name me any other 40-year-old technology that you're still using? There's not a lot of those around. There's a, you wouldn't want to be using a 40-year-old computer, or a 40-year-old disk drive, or 40-year-old memories, or 40. No, yeah, but you were still using 40-year-old technology. No, yeah, maybe not exactly the same as the Ethernet of of, uh, of Bob Metcalf. Supposedly, 
supposedly, Bob, uh, by the way, I'm not the inventor of Ethernet. Bob Metcalf's the inventor of Ethernet. He did it. Uh, it was done for the Xerox Alto uh, experimental uh, desktop machine. Uh, so supposedly the machine that Steve Jobs saw when he went and copied it uh, became a Macintosh. <clears throat> I had an Alto on my desk in 1978-79. Uh, it was great. I did my uh, one of my master's thesis theses uh, on the uh, on the Alto. It was the first time that anyone at my university had ever seen a thesis that was done on essentially a word processor. And I had graphics in it. They couldn't figure out how I, had, how I did that. It was you know, graphical, graphical user interface word processor. Supposedly, Bob drew this drawing on a bar napkin uh, at a place in Palo Alto, and that became the Ethernet. I think this is a modern recreation of that for a couple of reasons. First off, Bob didn't have colored pencils with <laughs> And, and it shows the ether as being yellow. And we all know that the ether was yellow. The ethernet was yellow, but I can tell you for a fact that I'm the guy who made it yellow, not Paul. This is one of my favorite colors. This, you people are too young. You think Ethernet is this little flimsy, twisted pair stuff, right? <laughs> twisted pair. As our former governor would say, twisted pair, that's good in that. <laughs> this is real Ethernet. <laughs> this stuff was so good, I used to keep a spool of it, you know, under the seat of my car. It was like having, a, you know, a weapon so you see somebody get a carjack in. The, the reason this is yellow, there's a couple of reasons this is yellow. One is because yellow is my favorite color. I drive a yellow car, I, uh, I have yellow furniture in my house. Uh, this color is, the actual color name is 1968 Corvette Yellow. <laughs> this is the color of a 1968 Corvette. The practical reason, the practical reason why it's yellow is because it's for those of you who don't recall, this stuff was strung up in the ceilings, right? You'd run, you know, a couple hundred meters of this stuff in the ceilings, and you'd put the transceivers on it, and, you know, it would run all over the place, and you'd drop taps down from the ceiling. Well, the way you attach a transceiver to this thing, you know, one of these puppies, right? The old vampire tap. And this thing would clamp onto the cable and, and hang up in there. So you literally, I'll get into a little more detail, in some later slides. But you literally have to drill into the cable. You drilled into the cable to tap into it without cutting the cable. Now there's a whole lot of cables up there in the ceiling. There's RS-232 cables. There's power cables. There's all kinds of cables. I did not want anyone drilling into a power cable. This would not be a good idea. So the way I wanted to make sure you could distinguish the power cable from the Ethernet cable was I made this thing as bright as I could possibly make it. So, because power cables are gray and black and stuff. Of course, now you go by extension cords, power cables are yellow. <laughs> so, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> Bob patented the Ethernet. Uh, there were originally two patents on the Ethernet. They were filed in 1975, a couple of years after uh, he did the prototype on the 73 Alto. There's one, this is the patent on the actual access control method. There was one other patent on an Ethernet repeater. But the interesting thing is, well, these, first off, these patents have long since expired. Uh, we wanted to make Ethernet as open as possible. We wanted people to make it. We didn't want to put patent restrictions in place. And so one of the things we did is um, we structured a patent license in an interesting way. Everyone here, you guys, you know, you look at Ethernet packets all the time. You know there's an Ethernet address. In the, there's a destination source address in the packet. And those addresses have a, you know, an organizationally unique part of it, and they have a station unique part of it. And when anyone wants to manufacture Ethernet equipment or any networking equipment these days, they get a block of addresses from the Ethernet Address Assignment Authority that gives you what's called an OUI, Organizationally Unique Identifier, and that gives you a block of addresses to go make stuff. Fine. At one point in history, by the way, I was the 
address assignment authority. You would send a request to me. And has anyone ever done that? Has anyone here requested an ROI or manufacturing agent? No? Huh. Uh, well, when you did that, it cost you $1,000. It was $1,000, and that allowed you to make, well, it gave you 16, uh, it gave you uh, 24 bits to play with. So you could make 16 million Ethernet devices with your thousand dollars, and if you made 16 million and you needed another 16 million, well, you could afford another thousand dollars. If you're selling 16 million of anything, you can afford a thousand dollars. And the reason we made it a thousand dollars was twofold. One, we wanted to make it low enough so that nobody who was seriously making Ethernet equipment could care. You're going to make products with a thousand dollars; it's in the noise. But we wanted to make it high enough so that every grad student didn't request their own address for it. <laughs> and a thousand dollars does that. But what you didn't realize, or may not have realized, is when you paid your thousand dollars for your address block, what you were doing legally is buying a license to that patent. So yeah, you got your address block, but in exchange, you got a worldwide royalty-free, non-exclusive right to make, manufacture, or have made, or have manufactured any and all the Ethernet equipment you want. The other thing we did, and most people didn't realize this, to, to this day I still see people making this mistake. We dropped the trademark on Ethernet. There's no trademark on it. So if you see Ethernet with a TM next to it, somebody's an idiot. Okay? <laughs> There's no trademark on Ethernet. We wanted people to make Ethernet stuff. Interesting. At one point, uh, the so the, the original Ethernet was, you know, for the Altos, it was never uh, made in wide commercial distribution. Uh, it ran at three megabits per second, actually two point nine something. Uh, and the reason it ran at two point nine something because that was the uh, the speed of the uh, clock in the uh, in the, the, the monitor. It was the, the speed of the refresh uh, the refresh oscillator in the Alpha monitor, so it saved them having to do another clock. So three megabits just for the heck of it. Uh, they never made a whole lot of those, but they did uh, briefly uh, during the Carter administration. There were some Xerox Altos doing word processing in the White House, and so uh, arguably the White House had the first installed customer Ethernet outside of the Xerox Palo Alto lab. Of course, I don't think it helped Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Why is this not a nice? There. So, Bob and his team at Xerox developed this 3 megabit Ethernet for the experimental Alto. Around 1978-79, DEC was very interested in expanding their local area network presence, basically because they had no local area network. They're a pretty good networking company, DeckNet and all the serial interconnections and all that kind of stuff. Deck sold more networked computers in the 1970s and 80s than anyone else. Anyone else, including IBM. IBM sold a lot of computers, uh, but IBM's were, Deck sold a lot more computers because they were smaller, and I, a lot of IBM stuff wasn't networked back then. We wanted to make it, take it out of the lab, take it out of the lab and put it out into the world. And that's, you know, it's, it's one thing to build a handful of something and get it to work in the lab for even for a hundred or a couple of thousand, uh, you know, handmade workstations. It's another to make something that you can ship millions of a month. You know, tens of millions a year, now hundreds of millions. So uh, the idea was take the basic concepts and now make it into a commercially viable product. What I can tell you is we changed just about everything from what Bob had. The only thing that was left was the basic concept, the idea of shared medium access on a local area network with you know, a coax cable strung in the ceiling. We changed the data rate. We changed the cable, not just made it yellow, it's actually a very different cable. Um, there's another reason, the cable. <coughs> we, made, we changed it from a 75 to a 50 volt system. Now that, most of your software-oriented folks. Any Ham hey, radio operators here? A couple. So am I. That stuff is great feedback. <laughs> that stuff is great feedback. 50 ohm solid center conductor, low loss and quadruple shield. I, use, I still use that stuff. Um, we changed the cable. We changed the signaling method. We changed the actual uh, you know, carrier sense collision detection algorithm. We changed the checksums. We changed the frame format. We changed the addressing scheme. 
but we left everything else off. <laughs> but we made it commercial. Oh, I actually have with me this is this is that. Uh, this is Ethernet spec version 1.0, September 30th, 1980. This is the very first copy that came out of the laser printer at Xerox Park that went to publication. So this is the original master copy. It's getting a little yellow here. But um, that's, that's the original master copy. And I have, I actually have the, uh, the disk, the backup disk that we created the file on. <laughs> Eight inch, not the little five inch, you know, PC. This is this predates PCs. So yeah, this is an eight inch floppy for a for a Xerox machine. I still have that. I have a master's thesis on that too, and I haven't been able to read it in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> we did version one in 1980, and then uh, we learned a little bit, and in 1982 we released version two. First, there's only some very minor changes. Uh, most importantly, the addition of some management features. Uh, but it was version 2 that became incredibly wildly popular, and uh, most folks were making equipment to version 2. Now, have any of you developed technology that has become a standard, worked on a standards committee? Nobody, nobody worked on a standards, a couple of people. Standards committees are not the way to develop technology. <laughs> Standards committees, legislative congresses, <coughs> sausage factories, they're all the same. <laughs> you do not want to see how stuff gets made. There's no way to get consensus among 400 people. It's not possible. You can ultimately get a vote and, you know, I win, you lose. But you can never get consensus. We didn't want that. We had <laughs> the famous, the famous three-company Digital Intel Xerox Ethernet Consortium, but we did it, we believe, the right way. Yes, we had the whole, you know, Xerox Corporation, you know, providing insight and technology, and the whole of digital equipment, and the whole of Intel, but they didn't get to sit in the room, and they didn't get to physically touch the spec and put words on paper. One person from each company had that responsibility. I was the, uh, the deck guy, uh, shown wearing my ether bunny costume. That was, you get me drunk enough, I will, I will chair a networking panel dressed up as the ether bunny. <laughs> Not today. Dave Woodell uh, was the guy at, uh, at Xerox. Uh, I, I, my responsibility was primarily for uh, what became the physical channel the cables, the signaling, the, all the analog stuff. I'm an analog guy. You're, you're mostly software people. I can do software too. But, you know, I'm mostly an analog guy. I, I'm, you know, not a ones and zeros. I was, you know, a one-eyed giant in the land of the blind and deck. <laughs> you know, nobody does analog design, but uh, that was my thing. Uh, Rob Ryan, was, who later went on to uh, found uh, Ascend Communications, was very successful with that, and now he runs uh, entrepreneurial workshops from his ranch in Wyoming, or Montana. He's in Montana, that's why he's wearing a cowboy hat there. Uh, but the three of us would get together and put pen to paper, and with, you know, clearly with the resources of our companies behind us. That's a much better way to do it. Three people can come to agreement, especially when we never listen to anything Rob had to say. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is most people think it's, it was the famous three company agreement with that Intel Xerox. It wasn't. It wasn't. The contract, there was, a, it was actually a technology transfer agreement between DEC and Xerox. It was a DEC Xerox deal, and the agreement allowed for Xerox to bring a mutually agreed to third party to the discussions. They brought Intel, and we knew they were bringing Intel. The reason is, Deck and Xerox were going to develop this networking technology, but nobody was going to buy into it if you don't have silicon. Right? Nobody's going to say, so, oh yeah, I'm going to go build Ethernet products. Who's making chips for it? I don't know. No, if Intel said, we'll make chips for this thing, 
then it, it lends some, some credence to it. But they weren't actually part of the deal. It was a very broad technology transfer agreement between DEC and Xerox. It was DEC, we will tell, you know, DEC will tell Xerox everything it knows about networking, and then Xerox would tell DEC everything they know about networking. Sounds like a good deal, except that DEC, we found out afterwards that Xerox didn't know a whole lot about it. <laughs> but that's okay. So fortunately, um, DEC made, you know, we shipped a lot of products. Xerox never shipped a whole lot of products. They still don't ship a whole lot of products in the networking space. And our philosophy at DEC was, uh, we don't care who gets credit as long as we get the money. And that's, that's, a good, that's a good philosophy to have in any sort of business venture. So here's your original, here's your original Ethernet. Uh, if, you, if you've never seen one of these things, back then you have the uh, you have the yellow cable here. That's that's the yellow cable that would be strung up in the ceiling, and you could run that all over your campus and all over your your office. You'd put these big ugly suckers. Uh, Along the uh, along the cable, and you drop a uh, what a drop cable, sometimes called an AUI cable or a transceiver cable, and that would come down to your desktop and <coughs> connect to the, to the to the network. Now, back then, this was 1980. Not a whole lot of desktop computers. What we were connecting were minis and mainframes and you know early workstations. Uh, the IBM PC hadn't shipped yet, not the first one. And even when it did, it had no networking capability, and it would be years before that uh, became uh, widespread. Freecom made a whole big living out of uh, bringing networking to the PC world, and that was their success. Freecom, by the way, was founded by Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet. Every, everyone who does something really brilliant at Xerox Palo Alto leaves Xerox Palo Alto and does and, and finds their success somewhere else. Nobody ever stayed there. Bob Metcalf left and did Freecom. And uh, uh, oh, um, I can't I can't remember the name. Somebody left and did uh, uh, Silicon Graphics. Jim Clark left and did Silicon Graphics. And uh, um, John Warnock left and did Adobe. And you know so 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 on and so on. So everyone develops great technology and they leave the world. Here's the famous vampire attack. You could put, they have put, you can get 32 of these on a chip this size now. Uh, this, is, this isn't the controller, this is just the transceiver. But back then, no silicon. We were building Ethernet without LSI silicon, without chips. Everything done in the streets. I designed that, that board, that's the board, the circuit board that goes inside this. That's a 10 megabit per second Ethernet transceiver. It's got a couple of hundred analog components on it. It's all transistors and analog amplifiers. There's no digital circuitry on that at all. A little switching power supply there. This thing, any, any of you ever installed a couple of these? Oh, we got some folks who put vampire caps on. We love this thing, right? One of the neat things about it was um, in order to install it, you had to take this portable electric drill, right? You'd go climb up and we had this little fixture and you drill into the cable and then you install that. That was really neat because back in 1982, portable battery-operated drills were rare. Now everyone uses battery-operated drills, but that was new stuff. So it was so every network person got a chance to go, you know, take a battery-operated drill home. So you know, you buy a, a deck. Deck was in the business. We sold you know millions and millions of these, and we sold a whole lot of electric drills too. I think we sold more electric drills than Sears that year. <laughs> really. Really, it was actually a, a pretty good business. I, I don't know if the margins are better on the drills than on the vampire caps. <laughs> this was 400 bucks. 400 bucks for the transceiver. This is the cable that comes down from the transceiver. And whoever raised your hand a minute ago and said you've installed these vampire caps, you have cursed me many, many times over. <laughs> For, for the infamous slide latch connector. Okay. Yeah. This is my, I, I take blame for this. Yeah. This was the second biggest mistake of my life. What was the first? I divorced her. Get on. <laughs> I, took, 
birthday yesterday. <laughs> I did. I got a, I got a nice email from my, I sent her a birthday, I sent her a birthday e card. <coughs> this was a great idea. The slide latch connector was a great idea with a bad implementation. If you remember from back in the old days when we had, you know, VT100s, terminals on our desk with RS-232 cables, the RS-232 cables had these tiny little screws in the back that, this was before, now we have these thumb screws, the big thumb screws, but back then we didn't have the thumb screws. We had these tiny little screws in the back, and you'd have to find some tiny little screwdriver because they were too big for a dime or fingernails that never quite did it, and so Nobody would ever tie the screws down. You would just take the connector, push it in, and then of course you'd move the terminal around and it would fall off or come loose and you'd start banging it while it's working and the network's down and then you look behind you, oh, the connector's off. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted a way to connect D sub mini, this is called a D sub miniature connector, to connect D subs without those little damn screws. And so I went to the guys at AMP who made this and also made the Vampire Pack for me. The guys at AMP, I used to go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania every couple of days. Uh, and the idea is this. First off, one end is male and one end is female. That says that if you need a longer cable than you have, you can just take two of them and use them like extension cords. You can't do that with typical RS-232 cables. They're you know, male on both ends and you need double females or you know, gender changers or whatever. Uh, so this has a male on one end and a female on the other, but that means one end has to have the lap, you know, one end needs the screw and one end needs the socket, and then that didn't work. And you can't have screws like that. So this, the idea was, you just push it on, push the latch over, and it locks it in place. Good idea. The problem is, these things were made out of really cheap stamped metal, and they were really flimsy. The other part of the problem was, these things needed a very, very precise spacing for the base to the connector. There were washers in there that put it in exactly the right spot for the latch to come over. And if this thing distorted at all because somebody bent it or they dropped it or, or it wasn't installed perfectly, it never quite made it up. You would either be jamming that sucker trying to get it on, or it would get on so easily that it would fall. So people, you know, did all sorts of they duct taped the cable to the transceivers, they tie wrapped it, they they cursed me. Uh, you can curse me. Uh, like I said, good idea. Bad here was the first Ethernet controller we did at Jet. Now today, an Ethernet controller is it's a library element on a you know system on a chip dot. You can you know you go to the, the chip library and you drop an Ethernet controller down. Back then we didn't have any silicon, so we built the whole thing out of I think it was Shocky TTL. Two circuit boards, nine by twelve inches to plug into a back to back plane just for the controller. Sold for three thousand dollars for an Ethernet controller. Well, hundred thousand dollar back. That's not too bad. Drew five volts at fifteen amperes <laughs> for an Ethernet controller. Well, the Vax had a lot of power available. The Vax, a fully configured Vax, had five volts on the back plane at 600 amps, <laughs> three kilowatts in that rack. And it's a good thing that the fans blew up, because if they blew down, the thing would take off into water. <laughs> we used to have, so, so, okay, so we put Ethernet out there, right? We put Ethernet out there, and you know the, the standards committee. I'll talk about that in a second. The standards committee started getting involved, but of course there's competition, and you know DEC and Xerox and a lot of other people were doing Ethernet, and IBM was doing token ring, and some of the industrial control people were doing token bus, and other people were doing other stuff, and we get into these battles. We get into these constant arguments. We have panel discussions at networking conferences about the benefits of coaxial cable versus twisted pair, or shielded cable versus unshielded, or token passing versus versus you know carrier sense. We get into these network wars. It's all moot. It's all moot now. Nobody cares. In the end of the day, we we learn. Nobody cares about what kind of cable it is. Nobody cares what the bits look like. Nobody cares whether the bits are going this way or around in a ring. The only thing people
people care about is, does it allow me to do my job? Can I run the applications that I want to run? Does it work? Is it cheap? And can I manage? Is it maintainable and, and, and you know, supportable? Other than that, who cares about tokens or cables or whatever? And that's the key. That's the key. That's what made Ethernet successful. Because Ethernet works. It may not be the most elegant solution. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because that means it's simple. No bells and whistles means simple. Simple means cheap. Cheap means volume. Volume means you make money. And that's all we're trying to do. And you get your job done at the same time. So it's interesting talking about volumes. Around 1995, I was doing some consulting work for IBM, uh, who had, by 1995, learned a little bit more about networking. They were a pretty good company, actually, back then. Uh, and I was out at their um, Research Triangle Park facility in North Carolina. That was their networking division. It was based out there. And I was doing some work on, a, on some Ethernet-related stuff for them. But of course, they were still selling lots of token ring. Token ring was king for IBM in the 90s. That was Bunch of you probably had a token ring. Nobody, anyone have a token ring? Left? You still have one? No. Nobody still has one. You still have a token ring. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so they were celebrating. They had this big banner up in the lobby, and they were having a party and a big celebration. They were celebrating the shipment of the 10 millionth token ring controller. 10 million token <coughs> ring ports. And they were celebrating. And then I spoke to my client and I said, that's really, really nice. You know 3Com is shipping 2 million Ethernet controllers a month? <laughs> <laughs> Every month? They ship 10 million since you know, the beginning of the year. You ship 10 million in your entire product life for 10, 11 years. They ship a million a year for 10 years. And 3Com was 40, about 40% 40 of the Ethernet market. So 2 million a month times two and a half. So the Ethernet market was 5 million ports a month, and token ring was 10 million ports in 10 years. Do the math. Which is why you don't have a token ring anymore. The bottom line is, money talks. Everybody walks. It's got to be simple. Who cares whether it's better? You can argue, well, token ring has this feature. Token ring is determinist. Who cares? Who cares? You don't see the bits in the wire as long as, the, as long as at the end of the day it works and it's cheap. That's what's the winning technology. Something to remember when you look at new technology. The question is, what is it doing that I can't do now? Is there any way I can do that without having to adopt the new technology? And how much is it going to cost relative to something else? So you, it's solve the problem at the cheapest price. <laughs> Move a little faster. Ah, oh, that's Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, right? And so, yeah, Bob develops it in the lab, and then we have to put it out in the field. <laughs> I had some guys like this, knuckle draggers, right? The, our, our network installers. Yeah, we used to refer to network installers as the missing link between the Neolithic <laughs> man and the Wombat. <laughs> wasn't that fun. But the ultimate evolution of the networking technology is the Standards Committee. And they really made a mess out of things. <laughs> now, I mean, we did our commercial, our, our 10 meg Ethernet, but things have changed a little since. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. But, uh, you know, Bob had his 3 meg Ethernet, and then we did 10 meg Ethernet on coax cable. And then uh, 3Com popularized what's called cheaper net, the thin Ethernet coax. And that was, you know, a cheaper solution, but a less reliable solution because it came down to every desktop. And you couldn't put quite as many stations on it. Uh, and then we had optical fiber Ethernet, and then we had twisted pair Ethernet, which came out around 1989, 1990, developed by a company called Synoptics, later became Bay Networks. Uh, and then 100 meg Ethernet, developed by a company called Grand Junction Networks, uh, and that got acquired by Cisco. Everyone gets acquired by Cisco. That's, that's sort of 
that sort of the business plan of Silicon Valley. Do something and get acquired by system. At least it was back then. I don't know if they're doing it quite as much now. Uh, 100 meg internet came out in 1990. Products came out in 92. Standard came out in 95. Gigabit Ethernet standard came out in 98 or so. Uh, and now we're into you know, 10 gig Ethernet, 40 gig Ethernet, 100 gig Ethernet. Uh, people were talking terabit Ethernet. So, you know, things move along, but it all came from Bob's original 3 meg stuff and the first commercial stuff. We shipped our first Ethernet products in uh, 1982. We did the first interoperability demo. This was deck equipment. You could print out a message on a Xerox laser printer from a deck vax on the show floor of 1982's National Computer Conference. Can you imagine a time when you could have a single conference that encompassed the entire computer industry? That's what this was, the National Computer Conference. It was big. It was in the Houston Astrodome. I remember spending about two hours trying to find my rental car in the parking lot. <laughs> You know, if you're driving your own car, you can find it anywhere. You can see the corner of the radio antenna, and you know that. <coughs> but you know, you're driving, you know, a nondescript blue Taurus in a sea of nondescript blue Tauruses. You know, and who remembers what the license plate was? And it was a hot day in Houston. So, what was Ethernet? Ethernet encompasses a lot of concepts, a lot of technology. For starters, or at least the original Ethernet, 10 megabits per second. And by the way, that was really, really, really fast for its day. That was a technical challenge, 10 megabits per second. We were laughed at. People said, what are you doing 10 meg? It's way, way too expensive. $3,000 controllers, $400 transceiver, big, fat, ugly, yellow cable. Why don't you do something cheap at 1 megabit? Why didn't we do something cheap at one megabit? Because it wouldn't have lasted long enough. You would have had to do it, you know, an upgrade before the market had traction. We wanted something that would last. 10 meg Ethernet lasted from 1980 until 1992. 12 years without a speed change. You haven't done that on your computer. You haven't done that on, on anything else. The speed, no speed change, and it was more than adequate. And quite honestly, 10 megs is more than adequate for most applications today because you're probably limited more by your internet connection speed than by your desktop LAN speed. Most users don't need more than 10 megs, but that doesn't stop you from, or stop us from selling them 100 meg and gig and 10 gig and all the rest. 10 megs, big fat ugly coax, shared bus topology. The original ethernet was everyone's talking on the same cable. We don't do that anymore. Everyone, we have a dedicated cable. Everyone has their own twisted pair that goes back to the wiring closet. Half duplex signaling. I talk, then you talk. I talk, then I listen. Today it's all full duplex. I can talk and listen at the same time. But the original was half duplex signaling. So, and CSMA CD access. This was Ethernet, right? You say, what's, what distinguishes Ethernet from token ring? Well, the Ethernet is carrier sense, multiple access with collision detect, and token is token passing or something else. So, we had a 10 meg signaling ring. That's we don't have 10. We have 10, 100, 1,000, 10, 40 gigs. Forget the coax cable, we're on twisted pair. Forget the shared bus. Everything is dedicated, dedicated media, switch, full duplex, half duplex is gone. There's no, C there's no CSMA CD anymore. There's no carrier sense. There's no collision detection because everyone's using switched Ethernet with full duplex switches. <laughs> what is Ethernet? The only thing you really care about. Ethernet is a packet format. That's the only thing that's left from the original Ethernet. It's a packet format. It's a preamble, an act, a destination, a source, a type field, data, and a checksum. You wouldn't, you could not imagine. Of all the things that we had the, the most contentious arguments about during the original development, the most contentious arguments, I mean, it almost came to fists, was the checksum, the frame checksum. 
and it was a battle between me and Ron Crane. Ron's a, a real nice guy. Ron's a real nice guy. He was one of the founders of Freecom. He went and did Freecom with Bob Metcalf. He's, he's still around the Bay Area. I see him occasionally. Um, now, nah, I can't tell that story if they're, if they're video <laughs> it'll, it'll get back to Ron. Ron's an interesting guy. Uh, but he was insistent on using a 16-bit checksum, and I was insistent on using a 32-bit checksum. Why? The 32-bit checksum is very, very robust. I was concerned about being able to detect errors in the face of noise. I was, being, I was concerned about having packets that had errors in them that were undetectable, especially at these very high data rates, like 10 megabits per second, and these cables that were all there. It sounds silly today, but it really was high back then. It was really pushing the, the edge of the, of the technology. And I was concerned about the undetected error. Ron was concerned that there were no chips available that could do a CRC32. CRC16 was available in silicon form because it was used in HDLC and you know the IBM uh, 3270 protocols and, and that stuff. So you could get 16-bit CRC in a chip, 32-bit CRC. You either had to build it out of discrete logic or wait for the wait for the you know what ultimately became the Ethernet silicon. Um, I won that battle. Uh, I think I, I, looking back, I think I was correct. I think that's, you know, I, I don't think Ethernet would have fallen apart with the 16-bit CRC, but it might have been flaky. I don't know. So, yes, all we've got is, it's a standard, it's a standard packet format, standard frame format. We use it on coax cable, twisted pair, optical fiber. We use it in <coughs> wide area networks, local area networks, metropolitan area networks, personal area networks, watches, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's almost exclusively full duplex today. There's one other thing that is that remains from the original Ethernet, and this was also considered innovative at the time. And that's the idea of globally unique address. That didn't exist. No network had that before. Now we sort of take it for granted. Back then, you know, anyone, anyone who raised their hand said they installed that cable. Remember ArcNet? Yeah, ArcNet from the, from the data point, another company that doesn't exist anymore. ArcNet was a, another networking technology. It used, uh, it used IBM 3270 style coax cable, 92 ohm coax. And that was the idea of it. It was meant to leverage off the installed base of, uh, of IBM coax cable and do a local area network on 3270 more. That's not a bad idea. They sold lots of stuff. But any time you installed an ARCnet device, you had to open up the box and set the jumpers and you know, set the address jumpers because it was an 8-bit address. And if you moved the box from one network over to another, you had to change the jumpers again. And you had to check with the network administrator to see which addresses were assigned where. We got rid of that. We got rid of that with 48-bit globally unique address. You stamp an address, you burn it into a device at the time of manufacture, and it stays the same forever, and you can plug it into any network and be ensured that no other device is going to have the same address, and they're going to last forever. 48 bits is a big, big number. I mean, people keep telling me, oh, well, I remember when we had you know, 64K of memory, and we thought we'd never run out. You know? And now you always need more. You always need more. We're, not, we're not anywhere near in danger of running out of 48-bit address, unlike the IP guys who are rather short-sighted. <laughs> you know, we did this first. 48-bit Ethernet addresses existed before 32-bit IP addresses. And it's even worse. It's not just 32-bit IP addresses. In IP, it's 32 bits for the network and the station ID. This is 48 bits just for the station ID. So, so yeah. And, and we've been living with uh, IP's mistake. I mean, that's why we all have NAT. Right? Um, but that's, that's for another talk. Uh, but the 48-bit globally unique address state, that was um, a really, really, uh, uh, a really, really good idea that came out of this. So. Yeah, we're doing fine. So I take a look back at what we did for the original Ethernet design. And we did some things right, 
And we did some things wrong. Of course, you don't know about the things we did wrong because we don't tell them until today. The most important thing we did right is we kept it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah, there's no complex management features. There's no control stations. There's no nothing. All this token ring crap. Token ring had tons of bells and whistles, tons of features. And IBM used to sell that. Say, see, our network's so much more powerful. Your network's so much more complex. Your network's so much more hard to maintain. Your network's so much more expensive. So keep it simple. That was the design of it. The spec is completely open. I put open in quotes. It's not open in the sense that we want the world to design it. We designed it. We designed it. Two or three guys in a closet went and designed it. That's how you do design. Ideally one person. Ideally one, but no one person had the complete skill set. But two or three people can go into a closet and design something. But then we, you know, like, you know, we gave our, our only son to the world, right? Uh, and we gave the specs out. We told everyone how to build this stuff. We didn't even copyright the Ethernet specs. There's no copyright for on it. We wanted people to copy it. We wanted people to build it. We, we used to get grief from upper management. Ken Olson, you know, had debt. You know, why are we telling our competitors how to compete with us? And Ken, I'd much rather have a chunk of a huge pie than the whole cupcake. <laughs> and that's really the choice, right? We could have had it. I could have, I could have had the whole pie. But it would be a pie this big. I get a slice of a really big pie. What makes Ethernet successful is that everyone buys into it. Everyone bought it. No trademarks on Ethernet, no copyrights on the spec. We got everybody involved. IBM's problem with Token Ring was they were the only systems vendor that was making Token Ring. Yeah, they got chip vendors to make stuff for them. And they got subsystems and boxes and you know cable manufacturers and, and diagnostic tools and things like that. But if you were building computer systems using Token Ring, it meant you were using IBM computer systems, not from the Ethernet. You were using DEC, you were using Sun, you were using ultimately Apple and, and all the PC clones and HP and, and everybody. That's that tells end users that they've got choices. It's not, I'm buying IBM and therefore it's Token Ring. In fact, Token Ring was, it wasn't you, you bought Token Ring and therefore you used IBM. It was the other way around. Was, you were using IBM equipment, therefore it was Token Ring. So you, the network was driven by the computer. We did it the other way around. You want this interoperable network, go buy your computers from anyone you want. But we made a couple of mistakes. First mistake was leaving your ring alone. <laughs> when I was teaching grad school, I had a philosophy that if your phone rang during class, it's mine. <laughs> this first one you're not going to believe. Should have been 1,500 bytes is the wrong number today. It's the wrong number today. Ethernet frame is 1,500 bytes. Yeah, don't tell me about mumble jumble frames. I know all about jumble frames. <laughs> the Ethernet frame is 1,500 bytes. It should have been longer. There's a trade-off in network design. If you make the frames really, really long, you make 10,000 byte frames, 20,000 byte frames, you make them really long, that does one good thing for you. It's efficient for, for bulk file transfer. If you're trying to move a whole lot of data, you're trying to move gigabytes, it's easier to move it in 10,000 byte chunks than in 1,000 byte chunks. It's, it's that simple. But there's a downside to it. The bigger the frame, the higher the probability that there's going to be an error. And remember, the way Ethernet and most networks work, if there's a single bit, single bit in error anywhere, you have to throw the whole thing away and try it again. So the longer you make the frame, the higher you increase the probability that that frame is going to be thrown away for an error. The other problem, remember on a shared bus, we were designing on a shared bus in the beginning. The longer the frame, the longer everyone else has to wait before they can send. It's like a train, it's just like trains. If you think of a train, really long trains are really efficient. One locomotive pulling 500 train cars, that's really efficient. You can move a whole lot of corn and wheat and sugar and people with a single locomotive, and it's a whole lot more efficient than having a locomotive for each car. 
However, when you're waiting at the railroad crossing, <laughs> you've got to wait a whole lot longer for the 500 car train to go by than if it was, you know, 105 car trains. So there's that trade-off. But why 1,500? Yeah, we thought about the length, and we thought about the error rate, and we thought about the access delay. But it comes down to the price of memory in 1979. If you're going to build a simple sheep controller without DNA, you're going to have to have a couple of packet buffers on the controller. You need at least two receive buffers so that you can receive two frames back to back. And you need a transmit buffer for sending. Each buffer is memory. If I had 10,000 byte frames, I need 30k bytes of buffer on a controller board. And in 1979, that's cost prohibitive. Today it's not. <laughs> Today, 30, 30 megabytes, who cares? You know, back then we were dealing with memory chips that were 1k bit, 4k bit, not by bit. Ultimately, it came down to the cost of memory. And we're living with that decision now. 33 years later, 33 years later, the reason the Ethernet frame is 1,500 bytes is because of the cost of memory in 1979-1980. Wish I could have changed it. Now, you look back and you say, well, why not change it now? Do you know why God was able to create the universe in six days? He didn't have to worry about the installed base. <laughs> You can't change it now. There's two billion Ethernet devices out there that can't understand anything longer than 1,500 by friends. And so, deal with it. And maybe if we had made it longer, it would be better today, but maybe it might not have gotten traction because it would have been way too expensive. So, I'm not going to argue with success. The 1,500 bytes, here was, here was what our mindset was on the 1500 bytes. The idea was, it's a thousand bytes of data payload. It's a kilobyte of data payload, and 500 bytes for whatever protocol overhead might possibly be layered on top of it. Links, and networks, and transports, and sessions, and VLANs, and, and security, and you know, we knew that people were going to start encapsulating and encapsulating and encapsulating. That's your whole life, right? Is digging out of these encapsulations. So we knew that was going to happen. We left 500 bytes for it. What are our encapsulations? And so the, the first people who implemented protocol, you know, implemented devices using Ethernet, used the entire 1500 bytes for the data and left nothing for the protocol. And so now we go, well, we wanted to add VLANs, but we, where are we going to stick the extra four bytes? We should have made it in the spec that, yes, it's 1,500 bytes, but you are not allowed to use those 500 for anything other than protocol overhead. And then maybe people would have listened, but we didn't tell them. But that was the rationale. That was the thinking. Um, that's now your problem as a packet economist. <laughs> leave that one to you. I, I want to do this. Is, I won the argument on CRC. I won the argument on CRC. I didn't win the argument on broadcast. I argued that we should not have broadcast. We should have multicast. True multicast, but not broadcast. Broadcast is a bad, there is never, ever, ever, ever a valid reason for sending an Ethernet broadcast and all ones frame sent at every station. It violates one of the basic rules of network, one of Seifert's laws. And that is, you should not be able to use the resources of a device without that device's permission. You should not be able to use memory, processing power, buffer space, resources without the station giving, allowing you to do that. Broadcast does that. It says, I don't know whether you even understand this message or this protocol or anything I'm saying, but you better receive it. You can't turn this off. That's silly. True multicast is very, very powerful. I love true multicast, where you're sending to a set of stations. What set of stations? The set of stations that choose to listen to that multicast. So anyone who's receiving it has implicitly given you permission to use their resources. 
because they've chosen to listen to that multicast address. If they don't want to be bothered with those multicasts, they would choose not to join that multicast group and you can't use their resources. And then, of course, even though we have broadcast, who's the idiot who decided that ARP should use broadcast? I, I've never met that person. I know who wrote the spec. I don't think he's the person who made the decision. That was one of the dumbest decisions of all time. Because that, especially at a time back in the 80s when IP was not king, there were devices, we were running IP, but we were running DeckNet, and we were running IPX, and Nobel, and we were running you know, a whole bunch of other XNS, and a whole bunch of other protocol suites. And these IP guys were sending these art broadcasts, and lots of them, and they were bothered. I'm looking at this thing, I said, what the hell is this? I don't understand IP, throw this away. But no, I gotta receive all of these damn broadcasts. <laughs> I would have eliminated the broadcast. I lost that one. And I would have eliminated the slide. <laughs> <laughs> somebody said, somebody brought something else up this morning uh, when we were having breakfast. And I said, oh, that should, that should have been on the list. And I don't remember what it was. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This was the other thing we should have changed. Everyone knew Ethernet. Carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Right? That means, carrier sense means you listen before you speak. If somebody else is speaking, you stay quiet. Multiple access means everyone has an opportunity to talk on the same shared cable, following the protocol. And collision detect means if you're talking and somebody else starts talking at the same time, both of you stop talking and, and back off. That's a very clean, simple, easy to implement algorithm. It's, if you go through the numbers, it's very, very efficient. Very efficient in terms of the amount of, of bandwidth used to resolve arbitration. But we should never have called it collision detection. Because in normal life, walking down the street, driving your car, collisions are something to be avoided at all costs, or at most costs. And people think, oh, I've got to get rid of those collisions. Oh, I'm getting too many collisions. I'm getting, co oh, this is a bad network. We've got collisions. Ooh. Collisions are a good thing. We should have called it carrier sense multiple access with arbitration cycles. <laughs> Which is what it is. A collision is an arbitration cycle. A collision is two stations are saying, are both saying at the same time, we both want to send something. Two stations are, are making a declaration, I want to send something now. Well, they can't both send something now, so we arbitrate for the use of the channel. We make the declaration, we recognize that the declaration is being made, and we go reschedule our transmissions using the random back-off timer. That's, that's an arbitration cycle. If we called it an arbitration cycle, we would have gotten a lot less grief. And thank you for not giving me a lot of grief today. <laughs>